tells us, Lord, and reminds us of the pain and the suffering we endure. And the top, Lord, who tells us of the blood that He shed for us. The blood that was able to cleanse and remove that sin and sin. How we bless you, O Heavenly Father, that we can show with joy this morning. Hallelujah, of us here. So, Father, we again appreciate, Lord, all that this peace means to us. We take it with joy this morning. Again, Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us to work for. We appreciate what happened, Father, that nothing more could be added that completed it. Because we saw in your son, your Lord, the perfect man. He said, Behold the Lamb of God, which take it away. So, Father, we say thank you.
to each and every one of you. You can certainly be a people, a thankful people this morning as we see how our great God has kept us and how he has kept Barbados in spite of perhaps our behavior as a country. But we can truly be thankful as we look to our neighbors and see that their results as a result of the disease is far worse than others. Thanks be to God. Amen. This morning I want to use as my text it's in John chapter 10 reading from verse 10. St. John 10 reading from verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You can just say immediately, which even sounds stronger. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We ask God's blessing on the reading of his precious word for his name and mercy's sake. Amen. Amen. This morning, I wish to focus my attention on certain aspects of the Lord Jesus Christ while he was here on earth. Of course, those of us who are past 60 perhaps would remember quite well that in the early gospel hall worship on Sunday mornings, the focus was primarily and in some cases solely on the Lord Jesus Christ, his suffering and his death and sometimes his resurrection. So I want to focus our attention this morning on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to begin by telling you that the Old Testament made several references by prophecy to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as a baby. In Genesis, God speaking to Abraham tells him that the nation is going to be blessed through him. The nation, and of course referring to the nation of Israel, would be blessed through him. In Genesis 28, speaking to Isaac, God said that the people on earth is going to be blessed through Isaac. And of course, both Abraham and Isaac are but the same lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, God said that by David, his kingdom was going to reign forever. And of course, in, there are many songs of the Utile season which made reference to David's line. And we know that the Lord Jesus Christ belong to that lineage. So the first thing I want to tell you is that the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ was carefully and purposely planned. It was not an afterthought. It was not an accident. His lineage was carefully planned and the place of his birth was carefully planned. We know it was going to be in Bethlehem, which was a small portion of Judah. And references of that was also made in Isaiah chapter 7. As we look at the Lord Jesus as a small boy, we know that we are told that his physical appearance was just like any other boy. God did not want him to appear physically like Superman because the message of his humility was to be made very clear. And you will remember how easy it was for Jesus to slip as a little boy away from his parents, move among the crowd almost unnoticed. And he was away for days until they had actually missed him. And uh, when he was found, of course, he was conversing with the, the elders in the temple. I take a quick look at the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And most theologians mark this beginning as when the time when he was baptized by John the Baptist. And they stretch his ministry from there up to the point in the upper room with his disciples when they're having that meal during what is now referred to as the Last Supper. Of course, you could also say that the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ did not end there. That after his resurrection, there was a short period where he also um, communicated with and spoke to people and persons before he ascended. There are some scholars who have even tried to date when that ministry started, and they put it at 26 AD. And I must say, speaking for myself, that it used to convert, confuse me at one point because I always thought that 1 AD started at the first year of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Apparently, they're telling me that is, that is not quite so. That 1 AD started somewhere, I think, 4 BC. It's a little confusing. But when they say 26 AD, this is when Jesus would have been 30 years old. And you know that his ministry lasted just over three and a half years. And after the baptism, he first went to Galilee, where he was talking and communing and ministering to people, performing miracles. And there he was tempted then after that, he was tempted by the devil in the Judean desert. Now the devil thought that he had chosen the opportune time to come to a man, and Jesus at that point was very um, human, to come to him in the desert when he figured that he would have been thirsty, he would have been hungry, and therefore he would have been vulnerable. But he did not realize and understand the power of the Almighty God and the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. No devil could tempt him with bread, simply because he was in an environment 
which had no food. Our Lord Jesus was more powerful than that. It is at that time around Galilee that the Lord Jesus selected his first set of disciples. And Matthew, the book of Matthew, covers most of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, at the death of John the Baptist, some scholars treat that as a kind of watershed period in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is at that point that you can see, if you follow carefully the Gospels, you can see that Jesus is preparing now to go to Jerusalem. And as we will see later, that was all part of God's divine plan for mankind. That trip from Galilee to Jerusalem. The last period, which is of tremendous importance in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, is that last week of his life here on earth. The Jews would refer to it, and some scholars refer to it, as the Passover week. In more modern times, believers and refer to it as Holy Week, a very important period in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospels, interesting enough, devote more than one third of their text to that last week of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because during this week, you could see that the Lord Jesus Christ, the focus is on his whole purpose for coming to this earth in the first place. Now Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem on that first day, which we refer to as the Sunday. And uh, you remember that there was a tumultuous welcome by the people, by the crowd, as Jesus entered. Because you see, as far as those people were concerned, their Messiah had come. The political leader had come. Here was the man who was going to liberate them from Roman occupation. That is how the vast majority of those people on that first day saw the Lord Jesus' entry. Now the Jews, the Jewish leaders and the religious people, they knew that Jesus wasn't about politics. They knew that his entry into Jerusalem had nothing to do with liberating the, the, the Jews from the Romans. They had another problem because they saw their influence being faded away because people were listening to Jesus and were becoming converted. So the Jewish leaders, the religious fellows and the Pharisees, they wanted to get rid of Jesus because if he had succeeded, very soon nobody would be looking at them. So they had a problem with him. They saw Jesus, of course, as a threat to them. But of course, we know now even if many of the crowd did not understand it at the time, that Jesus had come to save mankind, to save men and women from their sin, not to get involved in politics. He had come to save men and women from their sins. And you might say that there was a clash of agendas at that point. Part of the crowd wanted a political leader. The Jewish leaders 
want to get rid of Jesus. And I must say that in very recent years, I've been studying this whole entry into Jerusalem. And at one point, it had me a little confused. I said to myself, but how could this crowd, who was so enthusiastic on this first day, when Jesus entered, and they shouted with such excitement, and they took off their clothes and put down on palm branches for him to walk on. Is this the same crowd that would have later shouted, crucify him, give us Barabbas? Now that was a bit confusing to me. But I have now consoled myself by saying that there were several different groups of people in that crowd. And I want to tell you also that, and remember that the early believers, a lot of them were struck with fear after they saw how Jesus was being treated and after, this, and after Jesus was crucified. And I know that it's a very popular thing sometimes to jump on the anti bandwagon the Peter, the anti-Peter bandwagon and criticize Peter. But let me tell you something. I firmly believe that Peter's love for Jesus was sincere. Peter's love for Jesus was sincere and nobody can convince me otherwise. But you put yourself in that position. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. You are walking with him. And then you see him on a cross. What are some of us going to think? That we'll be next. So that's all it was. It was fear. But even after that point where Peter denied Jesus three times, you still see expression of the love that Peter had for Jesus. And what I want to tell you this morning as is that Jesus going to Calvary was a solution to many difficulties. Yes, as I said earlier, there was a clash of agendas where we saw how that crowd behaved on that first day and how they behaved at his trial. But we must understand, don't pay too much attention perhaps to how that crowd behaved. But you must understand that prophecy was being fulfilled. The purpose for which Jesus had come to the earth was being fulfilled. Let me remind you that Jesus had to go to Calvary. Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ had to die. Because we know from the very Old Testament that it was only by the shedding of blood that sin could have been remitted and the price could have been paid and sin washed away. So, the Lord Jesus Christ had to go to Calvary. He had come to earth. He had fulfilled his purpose. And everything was going according to God's plan. He went to Calvary because he had to pay the price for all mankind all mankind. What I want to say to you this morning, as I draw to a close, that each one of you in here must make sure that by our behavior now and the choices we make, that we do not tell anybody by our actions that as far as we are concerned, Christ died for vain, in vain. You don't want that. So it means that if you have not yet been committed to him, do so without any further delay. There's a very beautiful chorus that is part of a, a hymn, but the chorus line is a very beautiful line which says, he could have called 
10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. And you know what? If he had done that, what would have happened? We'd be lost. There would have been no shedding of blood. There would have been no Calvary. But we are thankful this morning that our Savior endured the agony, the shame, and the pain so that we have that authority this morning. We are placed in that position that we can call, look to our God and call him Father. Don't let his sacrifice on Calvary be in vain as far as you're concerned. Thank you.